All right, ladies and gentlemen, today, is, I guess if I haven't met you, I'm David Celentano, Chair of the Department of Epi. Uh, this is our fourth and last uh, centennial event uh, for the year. I like to think that we saved the best for last, but we had a great hors d'oeuvre at the beginning of the meal, if you recall. Uh, today we have uh, Chris Byer, who's the Desmond Tutu Professor of, oh Lord, how does it go? Oh, is it on there? Oh, okay, Public Health and Human Rights, I should have, and Director of the same center, without the Desmond Tutu on the front of it. Um, I think you all know Chris. Um, he's been on our faculty for many years, uh, 1992, that's right, it's November 1992, we hired you. Uh, and uh, Chris is going to be presenting today um, with Patrick Sarlin. Patrick is um, a former member of the CDC, the Division of HIV Prevention, was a branch chief and acting something for a while, uh, but he's now a, a, a professor of epidemiology at Emory and is extremely well known for his epidemiologic studies and particularly now on disparities in HIV. So with that, let me turn it over to Chris and we'll have the final event. Well, thanks very much, David, and uh, delighted, delighted to be speaking to you all, to be here today. Really delighted because I uh, flew back all last night from Shanghai, and uh, <laughs> so I was a little worried that I might not make it, uh, but I am here. Um, and let me just start by saying, uh, actually, as, as David said, I was hired uh, by him uh, and Ken Nelson uh, in 1992 when I finished my training at Hopkins uh, to be the field director for a new study that they had in Chiang Mai in northern Thailand. Uh, and I basically have spent my entire career in this department, uh, and what a wonderful place it is. <laughs> and it's so wonderful to work with all of you. Uh, and I really mean that. Um, I, I think I wouldn't have stayed here if it wasn't a great place to be. And, uh, and I think we're all really fortunate that it's also a great place to do work on HIV. Um, and we've been able to do together a lot of really important work in that field. What I want to talk to you about today is, uh, of course, a new intervention, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, particularly about the impact that it's likely to have on men who have sex with men, but also because I think we as, as epidemiologists uh, need to think and rethink how we're going to study risk, how we're going to look at behavior, how we're going to understand uh, HIV transmission and the future of prevention, but also the future of epidemiology uh, in this new era. Um, and I invited my friend and colleague, Patrick Sullivan, because we have been working together along with Steph Burrell and others here uh, on uh, some initial prep work uh, in South Africa and also have a new project I'll tell you a little bit about um, doing prep effectiveness uh, for high-risk young MSM in Thailand. Uh, and so this is a very living uh, and expanding collaboration. Uh, so in black is what I'm going to talk to you about, a little bit of the current epi of HIV and how that impacts our thinking about PrEP, uh, a little bit of the PrEP data for those of you who are not so familiar, and then uh, talk a little bit about uh, how we're going to assess risk in this PrEP era once it begins. And I put that as <laughs> once it begins because as you'll see from Patrick's data, uh, we really are just at the beginning of PrEP access uh, and uptake. And then he's going to follow talking about some of the great work that he's been doing in Atlanta. Um, in particular, the health disparities issue that David alluded to, um, thinking more about the PrEP implementation, the continuum, uh, the uptake, and then going to share some new tools uh, and approaches for, for how we might actually take this intervention to scale. Uh, so, where are we? We are still in a period, unfortunately, despite the rhetoric that's out there about the end of AIDS, uh, where we uh, have, of course, lost almost 40 million people to this pandemic. Last year, still one and a half million people. We have about 37 million people living with HIV. Um, and uh, last year, we had 2.1 million new infections. So that's where the part, at least, where the PrEP need is. Um, we still have less than half of people uh, living with HIV on treatment. And it probably, as everybody here knows, the WHO recommendations on immediate therapy are going to come out on World AIDS Day. 
and 22 million people are going to be eligible for treatment who are not currently on it. Uh, and we're out of money, by the way. Uh, so we have a daunting task ahead. And in terms of PrEP, despite all the data I'm about to show you, we essentially still have one country implementing PrEP. This World AIDS Day, uh, if everything goes as planned, although they've had uh, obviously other things on their minds, France is due to announce that they'll be the first European country to implement PrEP and put it through their national health. So good news there. So why PrEP? Why are we even thinking about putting HIV uninfected people on pre-exposure prophylaxis to reduce HIV risk? Well, the key reason is that HIV is so concentrated uh, in some very particular populations. And that's true in many countries in the world, but it certainly is also very true in this one. And we define, we've been using a definition in our group that key populations in HIV are people who have a disproportionate burden of HIV infection, but who also have a lack of access to essential services. Uh, so that's what really puts people in a, in a special risk uh, environment and a special risk challenge. And that includes gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, sex workers of all genders, people who inject drugs, transgender women who have sex with men, and then several other populations who sometimes are in key populations or not, women and girls in the hyperepidemic uh, East and Southern African regions, adolescents from all these communities, uh, and then of course, HIV uninfected partners in discordant relationships, either same sex, opposite sex, or with transgender partners. So how concentrated is the epidemic in the US among men who have sex with men? Anybody know? Students should all know this. What, what proportion of new infections last year in the US were in men who have sex with men? 62%. And we, gay men in this country, represent you know, less than 3% uh, or so of men, and that means less than 1.5% of US adults. So 62% of infections in our relatively small community is highly concentrated. These are the most recent data from the CDC that show you actually, and these declines are statistically significant, that heterosexual contact has been in decline in this country, injection drug use happily. Many people in this room have worked on that aspect of HIV also in decline. Male to male sexual contact is the only part of our epidemic that's expanding. Uh, and it has a marked health disparity, which Patrick is gonna talk with you about. Uh, and that disparity is both racial and ethnic, so the pink color here is African Americans. You can see, for example, in the south, in the center there, is this gonna work as a pointer? Yeah. Uh, just an enormously disproportionate burden, uh, although white men in the south also have elevated risk, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit as well. We've been keeping track of global incidence data. This I know is hard to see, but this is all the available incidence data on men who have sex with men globally. It includes the US. And it starts in 1995, and the reason we've started there is because, of course, 1996 is the beginning of the heart era, triple therapy, effective treatment. And for many populations, what we've seen is that that also was kind of the peak of the dying, and you begin to see declines in new infections. But for men who have sex with men, if you just look going from, from 99 up to 2014, that is not what we're seeing. What we are seeing actually is globally expanding epidemics among men who have sex with men in the heart era. And that is really challenging and it's hard to understand. Um, also some other populations uh, very heavily burdened. This is a special issue of The Lancet that we guest edited for the last International AIDS Conference looking at sex work. I won't show you much from this except to say that um, this is, again, a population with very high burdens of infection and marked lack of access to essential services. The dark red color here is over 50% prevalence. Uh, so as you can see, Sub-Saharan Africa, and particularly the Deep South, uh, extraordinarily high prevalences. And Steph Burrell, Sheree Schwartz, and their key populations program have been doing a lot of the epidemiology in this group and finding consistently burdens of disease, not just over 50%, but in the 70% range. So really an extraordinarily uh, burdened population. And then uh, also some work by our group led by Steph and with Tonya Petit, uh, myself and others. Uh, all the available data, at least up through 2012 or so, in transgender women who have sex with men, 
Uh, and this turns out to be the population uh, comparing them to other reproductive age adults uh, with the highest burden uh, or most disproportionate burden of any population, an odds ratio of close to 50. Uh, and uh, this represents data from about half a million uh, transgender women worldwide. So uh, that is why we are interested in new preventive interventions, and particularly for MSM, which is going to be a lot of the focus of this talk. The, the epidemic is expanding. Our current preventive interventions are not working uh, for this population, uh, and we have a new tool, which is, of course, very exciting. These are uh, some of the data from the more recent trials. Uh, this is pre-exposure prophylaxis, both oral and topical, so topical here mostly being vaginal uh, microbicides. Uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, uh, the line of uh, zero efficacy here. Uh, everything to the left is harmful or no efficacy, and to the right is where you have uh, efficacy measures. This is the French on-demand PrEP trial, close to 86% uh, efficacy, so that really worked very well. This is the PROUD uh, implementation study, gay men in London and, uh, and across the UK, also in that same range, about 86%. This is a partner study of heterosexual discordant couples, also looking great. Um, uh, and IPREX here, which was the first of these studies, uh, this was a global study of men who have sex with men and transgender women, included our collaborative uh, site in Chiang Mai, uh, the first really demonstrating efficacy at about 41%. So overall, uh, oral PrEP, and certainly oral PrEP with Truvada, that's a two-drug combination, uh, tenofovir and emtricitabine, really showing consistent and high efficacy for men who have sex with men. And that is really very striking because since the condom, we have not had a new intervention with efficacy for rectal exposure, right? Um, so really quite remarkable. Huge disappointment with the vaginal microbicides, as probably everybody here knows. One study that suggested modest efficacy at about 30%. And then the big phase three trial that was going to hopefully replicate that, uh, looking, as we say in New York, bupkis, you know, really <laughs> nothing there. So uh, I thought it was worth just pointing out that there also has been one trial actually with tenofovir, so the single drug uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis with injection drug users. And this was the CDC Bangkok uh, study. Um, as with the others, uh, showing overall uh, reductions in infection. This is infections on tenofovir. This is placebo. It took some time, actually more than, a, more than two years, to really start to diverge in these curves, but eventually uh, good efficacy. And this has just been reanalyzed for the 400 or so women in this trial. Um, and it turns out that the effect size uh, for women was about twice that of men, uh, probably because a lot of their exposure was sexual and not parenteral, although we really don't know that for sure. But nevertheless, this works for drug users, too. Uh, and so for that subset of men who have sex with men who also inject drugs, PrEP is recommended. IPREX uh, continued in what was called an open-label extension. So this is not a placebo-controlled trial, but rather now uh, basically offered to everybody who also was in the placebo arm. Uh, and then they were able to look uh, carefully at the active ingredient in blood, um, thanks to uh, Craig Hendricks here at Hopkins, which is uh, intracellular tenofovir diphosphate, for those of you who are interested. And basically what you see is that um, there is an extraordinarily correlation uh, between blood levels and efficacy. So um, if you had no drug detected at all, there was about a uh, 4.7 percent incidence per 100 person years. So that's a very high incidence density, right? That's close to five per 100 person years. Um, for people who had blood levels consistent with taking two tablets a week, that was halved, so that's still pretty good, but it was still 2%. Got better, uh, but basically once you get to four doses a week or more, there were no new infections. So not only is this an effective intervention, but it's also relatively forgiving. So no difference between whether you took it every day, six days a week, five days a week, or four. So that really is a bit the threshold. And one of the, one of the nice statements from this paper, I thought it was worth repeating, is that uh, our study shows that uptake is high when barriers to PrEP supply are eliminated. Um, 
it's an important thing to keep in mind because we got an enormous number of barriers to PrEP supply right now. Um, I thought it also was worth mentioning that uh, there is, of course, daily dosing. Uh, the French trial, the one with actually the highest efficacy, was intermittent dosing. And there have now been a couple of studies, and this is one from the HPTN ADAPT, that compare daily versus coitally dependent PrEP. And this is some of the first data we have on daily use for African women, and it turned out that they did much better uh, with daily than intermittent. Uh, and it is these data that have led to uh, initiation of PEPFAR program is going to do PrEP uh, for African women and girls in a number of countries. So uh, this is really very encouraging. But then we had, in September, those of you who read the New York Times saw uh, this story. Insurer says clients on daily pill have stayed HIV free. And this was the results of a paper in CID, Jonathan Volk and his group from Kaiser, that basically is some of the first true implementation data we have, operational data on free exposure prophylaxis. And this is basically just a clinical population, about 660 men uh, and women, followed over 36 months, uh, so about almost 400 person years of observation. This was open to people within the Kaiser system who met the CDC criteria, so that would include, for example, people in discordant couples, people who inject drugs, transgender women. But in point of fact, 99% of them were gay men. Uh, most of these were men in San Francisco. Uh, but the bottom line here is that everybody met risk criteria, and if you want to go back and look at this paper, you'll see that there was a great deal of ongoing uh, sexually transmitted infection uh, incidents uh, among these men, but nevertheless, no new infections. Uh, so it isn't that often that the effectiveness of an intervention looks better than the efficacy, um, but that really is very encouraging. But there are other aspects to PrEP, uh, and of course this is a daily dosing of people who are uh, sexually active and at risk for HIV are taking to reduce their HIV acquisition risk. So what does that mean? What does it mean to them? Well, there's just a very recent paper out from uh, Bob Grant, a colleague who's been really one of the leaders in this field. He was the PI of the IPREX trial, um, asking the question, what do people want from sex and what do they want from PrEP? So here's a couple of key points from that paper. First of all, they argue that, that PrEP has really reached a tipping point in 2013, and the use has been expanding in 2014 and 2015. Patrick is going to show you the actual numbers on that. It's pretty, still pretty minimal, but nevertheless uh, picking up. But what PrEP users report is, is uh, what they call fringe benefits, uh, which is feeling safer during sex, having less anxiety in sexual encounters, feeling less HIV stigma, and reporting strengthening of relationships. So those are highly valued things, right? Not being afraid of HIV acquisition. For, for gay men, uh, certainly of my generation, we have spent 30 years afraid of HIV acquisition. So this is really an enormous sea change. Um, they looked at behavioral economics, suggesting that some of these fringe benefits are compelling because they have salience for people. In other words, they matter to, to the way people are living their lives. Uh, they're effective. They affect people's feelings and emotions in a positive way. And they're experienced in the present. So the, the actual experience of feeling protected uh, during sex is not something after or related to a vaccine many months ago, but actually right around the time of the exposure. And the bottom line really is that PrEP is empowering people to have control over their HIV risks and not relying on partners, right? These, these are uninfected folks, many of whom are having sex with HIV-infected partners uh, or partners of unknown status, not having to rely on partners to use condoms, to take ART or to accurately disclose their status. So that is an enormous change in people's actual experience of having sex in the HIV era. But there's some cautionary uh, notes to this, and I don't want to paint too rosy a picture, and one certainly uh, is the data that was presented at our IAS meeting this summer in Vancouver um, from the Adolescent Trials Network. This is ATN 110, the PI was Sybil Hosek, who very kindly shared these slides. 
Um, this is the sexual behavior. This is a, a prep demonstration project in young gay men um, starting at age 18 and going up to age 24. Um, and just to say, uh, these are a number of different sexual behaviors, including um, condomless receptive anal intercourse with the last partner, which is in blue there, uh, that there was a, uh, you know, high rates of risk taking at the beginning, some decline, and then a modest increase. Overall, there is no significance for trend here. So there was not a major increase in sexual risk, uh, risk taking, which of course is a big concern. They also use the same assay looking at intracellular tenofovir diphosphate, which is the active ingredient. Uh, and as I said earlier, the cutoff point really is four doses or more a week is where you get therapeutic blood levels, which we think correlate with blood levels in the gut, which actually, of course, is where rectal exposure happens. Um, and so what you're looking at here is uh, the overall, I'll show you the overall curves, and then the breakdown by race ethnicity. So overall, uh, these young men uh, did okay initially, got up to therapeutic levels as a median level across the cohort, and then fell off and actually did badly. So if you just saw this, you would say, gee, PrEP, adherence, uptake, not so good among adolescents. And that's unfortunate because that is, of course, a critical risk group. But now look at, this is the white young men in this study. Uh, they started out above the line of, of uh, protection, and they stayed there, and they did great, and near the end of the study, they actually were looking even better. So these folks were protected. PrEP really worked for them. Good news. Latino MSM, also looking good. This is people who said they were of mixed race. Most of them were black and white race, and then this is the African American guys. So unfortunately, they never reached therapeutic levels. They did very badly. And there were enough of them, and they did badly enough to drag down the overall curve. So what that suggests is that the health disparity that we see in HIV uh, with African Americans and with African American MSM is not being effectively addressed by PrEP. Um, so that enormous space there, that's a research agenda for all of you young investigators who are interested in this area. That is a critical research agenda going forward. So all of these PrEP data together have led to the WHO interim uh, recommendation, just came out in September. The final recommendation will be out uh, on World AIDS Day. I co-chaired the guidelines uh, for key populations where we were able to get uh, PrEP for the first time uh, recommended by the WHO. And here's the interim recommendation. So oral PrEP containing tenofovir should be offered as an additional prevention choice for people at substantial risk of HIV infection as part of combination HIV prevention. A strong recommendation and high quality evidence. So for those of you who know how these WHO guidelines go now, they ask PICO questions, they go through a very formal rigorous process, and they grade the evidence. So you don't see strong recommendation and high quality of evidence every day from WHO. Anybody know what their recommendation on condom use for anal sex is? Weak recommendation, conditional evidence, because there's never been a randomized control trial, right? So, but there's a, a couple of very important points here. One, I think, is really critical is this, right? What do you mean by substantial risk? What do you mean by that, right? That's a very important question. So they defined this, and it's actually interesting. And this is the first time with this iteration of the guidance that they've defined risk not on an individual basis, but rather on a zero incidence estimate in the population. Uh, so that's a very important benchmark for all of us to work on. And for those of you epidemiologists who enter surveillance, this is very good news because there isn't much incidence data out there and we need actually quite a bit more of it. If we're gonna use incidence measures to do population determinations for PrEP, we got a, a long road ahead. So how have they defined it? Um, provisionally as incidents greater than three per 100 person years in the absence of PrEP. And that's very important because of course as PrEP uptake begins, hopefully we're going to see declines in new infections. Uh, so it's three per 100 years in the absence of PrEP, which is substantial. So here's a question for you. Injection drug users in Baltimore. We have great data, Shruti Mehta is here, you know, the ALIVE cohort. Is it anywhere near above three per 100 person years? 
What's the incidence now? Less than one. So injection drug users in Baltimore would not be a population that we would recommend for PrEP. How about men who have sex with men in Baltimore? Yes, vigorous nodding. And African-American MSM, unfortunately, way above three. Uh, so clearly, um, this actually, I think, is, is really a useful advance. One of the reasons they made this recommendation, and this is from the WHO guidelines, is by looking in the PrEP trials at the seroincidence in the placebo arms. And in most of these studies, uh, the rate, uh, particularly among MSM, was in the three to nine range, which of course is extraordinarily high. So I wanna ask a couple of questions before I hand this over to Patrick, because uh, I think we're now also in a new place in terms of understanding and thinking about how we're gonna measure risk. So risk assessment for gay men and for men who have sex with men has really focused on risks for acquisition, obviously, very important for prevention. And the most important risk behavior is unprotected receptive anal intercourse, right? URAI, and you'll see that in so many papers and publications, and many of ours. Um, so what do you mean by unprotected? Right? For 25 years, what we have meant is you didn't use a condom. But now we have two very different situations. First of all, uh, many people in the community uh, think about safe sex as sex with somebody who has HIV and who is fully virally suppressed. Right? And people post on social media their status, that they're fully suppressed. Uh, and secondly, of course, now we have PrEP. So is condomless receptive anal intercourse where the uninfected partner is on PrEP unprotected? We could do a straw poll. But it's a very important question to ask ourselves, right? Uh, because it's not enough now just to say condoms yes or no. Uh, and if PrEP is protective, and the data suggests that if you take it, it really is, the adherence is good. Um, so what does condomless receptive anal intercourse plus PrEP look like? And we're going to have to change the way we do this ascertainment. Um, and for example, we're going to have to rethink how we look at other preventive interventions like HIV vaccines. Do we have to offer PrEP in the context uh, of a vaccine trial? Uh, and if HIV-infected partners are sustainably virally suppressed, is condomless sex protected? Because let me tell you, that is where the community is. That is how people are thinking about this, whether or not we're ready for that. I just want to share with you that happily we have a new, uh, newly funded R01, this is a NIAID R01, that's going to be looking at combination effectiveness uh, for young MSM in Thailand. And this actually is focusing on the subset of men who are sex workers, men who sell sex. So at least to our knowledge, this is going to be the first effectiveness study of what we call occupational prep. Um, and uh, we have a number of collaborators. Uh, Patrick Sullivan is a, is a partner of ours, happily, um, but also with Mahidon University in Bangkok, with the Thai Ministry of Health and with the US CDC, and a number of, uh, of Hopkins colleagues are on this. Um, and this is going to look at, at assessing, developing, and then assessing the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of an intervention with and without PrEP uh, for these young men. I'll just share with you that this Bangkok, Thailand, is actually, as far as we know, the largest male commercial sex industry in the world. These are all uh, the uh, zones of commercial sex, and our partner, the uh, Sex Worker Union uh, in Bangkok, uh, has mapped all of this. They do these uh, updated maps. This is just one. There's, uh, as you can see, six of these areas. I'm just showing you one of them and giving you a sense of the enormous number of these places, um, go-go bars, massage parlors, karaoke's, uh, bars with hosts, spas, uh, and this is where we're gonna be uh, rolling out prep. So I wanna thank a large number of people, uh, and I, I have to again thank David Chantano and Ken Nelson for hiring me uh, 23 years ago. Uh, there are lots of people who've contributed to uh, all different parts of this, but in particular, uh, our group here at the Center of Public Health and Human Rights, Steph Baral, Tony Petit, Cherie Schwartz, uh, Brian Weir, and Andrea Wirtz. Uh, this work has been funded by AMFAR, by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, some of it by USAID, and of course our terrific uh, CIFAR. And uh, now I get the pleasure of handing this over to Patrick Sullivan. Thanks for your attention.
So I'm reminded um, as I pull up my slides that, uh, that Chris Byer is a hard act to follow. But I will <laughs> do my best and thanks to Dr. Chalantano and um, to all of you for having me as part of your um, centennial celebration. And I really wanna um, try and pick up where Chris left off uh, by thinking about how some of the things we're doing, um, looking at prep implementation and the challenges of that, um, which Chris has set, described and set up so nicely. So I think as epidemiologists, we always wanna start with the epidemiology. And um, one of our uh, projects is AIDSview.org, which maps out HIV epidemics in the US um, at different levels of geography. So this is a county level map of the US and emphasizes what a lot of us um, know because uh, according to the Census Bureau, uh, you share residents in the South with us here in uh, Baltimore in the southern region, which accounts for about half of the cases. And the other point I think that's important about this map is not just the impact in the southern US, but that many of the, the heavily impacted areas by rates, so here the darker colors um, represent uh, higher rates of HIV, and many of those counties are not urban counties. And so the, the phenomenon here is not a solely urban um, problem. And, uh, and so I'll talk some more about how that plays into our PrEP programs. The other thing to emphasize is that in the United States, as, as uh, Chris set up nicely globally, this is now a county level map which where data are released by health departments depicts the proportion of all HIV infections within a county attributed to male male sex. And the story is that there's 10 levels here of you know, proportion of cases attributed to MSM and um, all of these counties are essentially in the upper three deciles of that. Compare that for example to transmissions attributed to male female sex among men which certainly has an important role in the South, um, but the male-male sex predominance uh, in terms of transmission category is, is pretty global. And so again, it speaks to our need to work uh, not just in cities, but also in rural areas. Uh, a lot of our thinking about PrEP has been designed by a study which has now completed uh, a, an HIV STI incidence cohort of black and white MSM in Atlanta called Involvement. And the purpose of this study was to try and understand the reasons for black-white disparities, which um, Chris noted, but uh, in, um, in MSM, three to five times higher prevalence among black MSM than white MSM, and why is that? Historically, the discussion um, has always started at, well, maybe black men use condoms less, or maybe black men have more sex partners or use more drugs. And, and over and over again, uh, studies have shown that, um, looks like I have a, uh, a timings um, gremlin, which I'll get rid of. Um, studies have shown that black men report comparable levels of risk. So how is it that black gay men report comparable levels of risk but have much higher um, HIV uh, transmission acquisition? So this study was a, a, a cohort um, design. We enrolled just black and white MSM in Atlanta, age 18 to 39. Um, who were not in a main partnership, and we did a baseline uh, HIV and STI testing, and for men who were not living with HIV at baseline, um, we followed them uh, for about two years with 79% uh, retention and assessed outcomes. Um, this is just the cross-sectional prevalence at baseline, but I think it tells such an important story. So these blue bars, uh, darkly shaded bars, represent the prevalence in black MSM, the orange bars and white MSM by age group. So in our 18 and 19 year old guys, six to 7% prevalence and not much difference by age. By 20 to 24, the prevalence in the young black men had increased to about a third. Um, and this suggests just an overwhelming incidence that occurs somewhere in this window. We'll, we'll look at the incidence findings. But it suggests <clears throat> that for young, young black MSM in this age group are a group that's definitely gonna meet that WHO criterion for an indication for PrEP. And the disparities, um, you know, persist then throughout old, older age groups until, you know, uh, some of these numbers get small, but, but uh, probably over half of black MSM in the older age groups in this study were living with HIV, an incredible impact. So I asked that, I asked that question before, how is it that black gay men have comparable levels of uh, numbers of sex partners, comparable uh, sex not protected by condoms, but have more HIV acquisition? And here what um, our, my colleague Colleen Kelly led this analysis and we basically used data from this, our study to model um, how many sex partners you would have to have as a black gay man uh, in the blue profile, as a white gay man in the green, how many sex partners would you need to have in Atlanta to have uh, a 50% chance of having a partner who was living with HIV and not virally suppressed? 
who is capable of HIV transmission, if you will. And if you sort of look up from the um, a horizontal axis for white men, that 50% uh, breaking point um, doesn't happen until seven UAI partners. For black men, that breaking point happens um, between two and three partners. And this has to do with the racial concordance of partnerships, the prevalence of HIV among black men living in Atlanta, and the l less viral suppression. And the reason this is relevant for PrEP is that if we apply behavioral criteria that says, have you had three or more sex partners? Um, have you uh, had a certain level of uh, sex not protected by condoms? All those are individual level metrics that speak to your individual behaviors. But what puts black men at risk in Atlanta is not their individual behaviors, it's the sexual network in which they are um, active. And so that, and I'll show you how that limitation of PrEP eligibility plays out in our data. Um, I just want to note uh, in terms of the, the cohort findings here, so this cohort finished in 2014, um, and you can see that the, uh, the, the sort of annual, uh, annualized infection rates are high for, um, for uh, both black and white MSM for STDs, but I especially want to em emphasize around 10% each of rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia. Another analysis from this cohort demonstrated that the attributable fraction of HIV transmissions that is attributable to rectal STIs is probably about 15%. So the fact that we have these high incidents of rectal STIs in, uh, in black MSM um, probably is another important factor in uh, HIV uh, disparities. And this is our HIV incidence rate. Overall, 6.5% for black men, 1.7% for white men, but in the 18 to 24 year age group, 11% um, for young black men per year. And this has since been replicated in a cohort in Jackson uh, in young black MSM. And so we, we thought when we saw this that this might be a spurious finding, um, if a shocking one. Uh, but I think this may be what the situation is uh, in some places in the South for young black MSM. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, um, about bringing interventions to scale. How much of this do we need to do to bend the curve? The title of the talk, talk was Bending the Curve. So um, these, uh, these modeling uh, with agent-based models can allow us to simulate epidemics in populations. Uh, the models are developed uh, in such a way that when they run, we can assess whether they produce about the number of new infections um, that we expect in a population. So imagine a population of, a hypothetical population of 5,000 gay men. We assign them certain behavioral characteristics. We assign a certain starting prevalence of HIV in the population, and this model simulates day by day they have a probability of meeting someone who's a sex partner. They have a probability that that encounter involves anal sex, probability that condoms used. If their partner, uh, their partner has a probability of being living with HIV, and they have a probability of acquiring HIV. And so these models can be calibrated and run in specific populations to yield, say, a 3% incidence, which is what we think is true um, unintervened. And the great thing about these models is that then counterfactual models can be run where we scale certain interventions to different levels, rerun the models and see what happens. And so in these models, uh, Steve Goudreau at UW um, and, uh, and uh, colleagues for, for a project for the Lancet uh, series um, made these models for the US, Peru, Kenya, and India. And the first set of bars here asks, Compared to the unintervened scenario, if we get 40% coverage of PrEP among behaviorally eligible men, what reduction in, in new infections um, would we expect to, to see uh, over a 10-year period? And that's something like 40% coverage of PrEP and 20% reduction in new infections. This was done at the time that the main estimate we had was from IPREC, so something around 50% efficacy. And so you can see there's sort of a uh, you know, half for one, 40% input, 20% output. These models um, ha can be updated with, uh, with higher prevalence estimates and or, or adherence estimates. And in fact, if you increase adherence, the, you, you increase the number of infections averted as you would expect. Um, another model uh, developed by Ron Brookmeyer uh, in conjunction with uh, Chris and Steph for a, a prevention project we're working on uh, with South African partners, use South African MSM data to parameterize a model. And here, it's the data are set up slightly differently, but still percent of infections averted. On the horizontal axis is the percent of men who uh, are found to be living with HIV uh, with, a low, with a CD4 count of less than 350, which was the then current guideline, who receive ART. And so you can see that providing antiretroviral therapy by itself without PrEP 
increases to some extent um, or averts some infections by itself. But when we add um, uh, PrEP to that at a 50% coverage level, um, sorry, with 50% PrEP acceptance, uh, that translates, um, depending on the level of treatment, to another 10% or so of uh, reduction of new infections. If we just reduce unprotected uh, anal intercourse not protected by condoms by uh, 15%, that re results in a 20-ish percent reduction in uh, new infections. If we combine those, we get close to 30%. That's with 50% PrEP, prep cover coverage. And to me, the real sort of kumbaya uh, message of this analysis is that, is that if you increase testing in conjunction with these, these are now the lines with triangles, at any, in any of these scenarios, increasing HIV testing increases infections averted because it helps direct people into the right bins in terms of being on treatment or being offered PrEP. So testing, it will always be part of this um, solution. So where are we? These models suggest that to make modest impacts on HIV transmissions among MSM, to bend the curve, we're going to need to achieve 30 to 50 percent coverage of multiple interventions at the same time. And that's a tall order. In the U.S., how are we doing with that? This slide shows in the blue bars the efficacy of certain interventions, uh, primary prevention interventions for MSM, uh, and and the orange bar is the, the uptake. So on the left is treatment as prevention, probably 95 percent effect, uh, efficacious at reducing transmission risk. We are virally suppressing about a third of MSM. Uh, for NPEP, which is uh, post-exposure prophylaxis, might be 80 percent uh, efficacious. We, you can bear, there is an orange bar there. You just can't see it very well. Um, for PrEP, I'll show you some more data about this, but let's say it's 80% efficacious or 86% as a couple recent trials have shown, very low uptake. Condom use, CDC says 70%, um, and that's probably the only of these where we're hitting in this box where we would like 30% plus coverage to, to bend the curve. Condoms are probably the only area where um, we're getting close. And so for me, this is a problem of scale and scale in the right places. Um, Colleen Kelly, uh, again, applied uh, data from our cohort to think about a PrEP continuum, and I think this gets just at what Chris um, was, was talking about. So of all the MSM in our cohort, 562 who were, who were HIV negative, about half of them were aware of PrEP and willing to use it. This is starting in 2010, so admittedly there was probably some change over time, but the awareness data has not changed that much, as I'll show you. So about half were aware. Um, of those, uh, about 85% had access to health care. So you've so you got to be aware of PrEP, and then you have to have access to health care. And then when you go in and you're asked those screening questions, you have to be likely to be offered PrEP based on the, the individual criteria that CDC currently recommends. So by that criterion, we get down to about 30% of those guys. And then um, if we have uh, IPREX-like efficacy, we might uh, end up with 15% protected. So that's a PrEP continuum for our guys in Atlanta. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're tracking this theme of racial disparities, we might wonder how that plays out for white and black men. Um, for black MSM who have less access to health care in our cohort and who may be less likely to be recommended PrEP based solely on their behavioral characteristics, because remember the questions are about number of sex partners and condom use, they actually um, have the potential to achieve a 12% protection of PrEP in our cohort making it through all these steps. White men, looking at the bottom line, get something like 18%. Why is that? Better access to health care. And the white guys who are at risk are more likely um, to, to be uh, called eligible under the current PrEP criteria, and so they get a little bit better performance. We actually know that 32 people in this cohort seroconverted, and if we look at those 32 seroconverters, under these current assumptions of awareness, access to health care, and the current PrEP recommendation, we would expect to have averted about four of those in the population um, in the circumstances that existed at the time of the study. Not a ray of sunshine um, for getting to our 30 to 50 percent coverage. But I also just want to point out that if you look at the left side, which is uh, HIV prevalence by county, and you look at the right side, which is our AIDS view map of percent of the population without health insurance, um, there's one state that stands out here for me, um, and it's Texas, because the darker red shades indicate more than one in five people living without health insurance, 
and Texas with I think a couple hundred counties and probably less than uh, probably five uh, to eight percent of them that have something other than the highest uh, quartile of lack of health insurance. And this is also a panel from our AIDS View um, site. If you compare those heavily impacted areas on the right to areas that are not moving forward with Medicaid expansion on the left, so the red area states are those that are not moving forward with expansion at, that, at this time, you can see that this issue of health insurance coverage is really foundational one for how we're gonna address Southern epidemics among black MSM. All right, so what did we learn from the PrEP continuum? Well, we need more awareness, we need more education, we need more health insurance, we need more adherence support, but we also need to identify better algorithms to identify MSM who are likely to become infected with, MS, with, with HIV. And, and currently the algorithm, the CDC algorithm does a less good job of identifying black MSM who will eventually go on to be, to acquire HIV in our cohort than for the white guys. For the white guys, it's uh, about 90% of those guys in our cohort would have been recommended PrEP based on their baseline uh, behaviors. And that number is lower for black MSM. So we need to revisit that. All right, I wanna show you some data from the American Men's Internet Survey. This is basically an uh, online behavioral surveillance study in the United States. Um, and it's meant to monitor trends in risk, behaviors, and service use over time. Uh, Baltimore is one of the sites for the National HIV Behavioral Surveillance System, or NHBS, which is only done in cities. And it turns out that the, the health needs and behaviors of rural MSM um, are actually quite different uh, than urban MSM. And NHBS is done once every three years, and we're able to do AMOS annually. And we, the, sur the survey instrument here is, is very consistent with the NHBS survey. So this is, um, this is led by Travis Sanchez. We, um, we interview sort of 10 to 12,000 men a year with a core questionnaire and certain modules, and we recruit through social networking sites, uh, mobile apps, um, and gay-oriented sites, and we do this uh, annually. So I'm gonna be showing you data from the 2013 and 2014 cycles. Um, first, I'll just show you a bit of demographics. So um, across both years, we, uh, we have um, about a third of the group that's under 30 and uh, a split of urban rural that's roughly one third, two thirds. So we get a, um, with the uh, sort of 10,000-ish 10, 10, respondents, we get thousands of rural respondents. Uh, generally, the education is, um, skews a little bit high and we get about a quarter uh, racial ethnic minorities, uh, men of color. So I want to focus on just some, these data, these slides are all going to be set up the same way, and I'll show you a number of them, but first we're going to look at awareness of PrEP. So this describes PrEP and says, before you just read about it today, were you aware of PrEP? So this is uh, data collected the, it, between sort of late 2013 and early 2015. And if you look at overall awareness, it's 59%. That is um, pretty comparable across uh, racial groups. So the columns here are black, white, Hispanic, and others. We're gonna to continue to look at awareness, um, but now look by age group. So the 59% stays the same, but we can now see that the 18 to 24 year olds who are one of our key groups where we think incidence is occurring um, are less aware of PrEP than are their older counterparts. Uh, when we look by year, we can see um, a substantial increase in awareness between 2013 cycle and, and 2014 cycle. We're now gonna look at willingness to use PrEP. And so in this, um, in this figure, uh, the yes willing um, uh, is the uh, uh, blue bar, the bottom bars. Um, so overall in this group, about 50% um, once described PrEP were willing to use it. And you'll focus on the yellow bars on the right um, for yes. The oranges are don't knows. So here um, we actually saw a higher willingness to use PrEP uh, among black and Hispanic um, respondents than among white. We look at willingness by age. There was a higher willingness in younger age groups um, once they were informed of PrEP. And when we look by year, there was a higher willingness in the, um, in the second cycle, uh, exceeding 50%. And we're actually gonna look at actual use of, self-reported use of PrEP. Um, get out your readers because uh, there are numbers here. It's 2.9% overall a little bit less uh, in the black uh, respondents compared to the white. So um, you're gonna see a little theme here, which is that the folks who uh, probably have the highest incidence in their populations have the lowest um, uptake. 
When we looked by age group, there were no 15 to 17 year old uh, participants on PrEP and the next lowest age group was the 18 to 24 year old with 1.5%. Uh, um, and by year, uh, over a doubling of the reported, uh, self-reported prevalence of PrEP use. Um, and, and the other thing that I didn't show is uh, by rural urban, there was much more in urban areas. And so this just highlights the challenge we have. Um, we're happy that Amos is, um, is in place and was in place over this period of transition and we're gonna continue to monitor. We're also going, in the earlier years, we, we asked a random half of the sample about PrEP use and we're gonna move to 100%. Um, that's gonna become a core, is a core question in this current data collection cycle. Um, I also just want to share a, a piece of great news uh, relevant to Chris's uh, quote of Bob Grant that, that uptakes high when you remove barriers. In our South African uh, study, which, uh, which staff and Chris are very much a part of, uh, as well as Linda Gail Becker and uh, Rafilwe Faswana Mafuya in uh, Cape Town and Port Elizabeth, we uh, are enrolled about 100 um, MSM in both sites to follow them prospectively. Of those, 80 in each site are HIV negative. And this shows in uh, Port Elizabeth in the blue bars and in Cape Town in the orange bars, um, on the left side, the interest in PrEP. Uh, and so uh, 70 to 90% of guys at, uh, negative guys at baseline were interested in PrEP. Most of them in the middle bars were lab eligible, meaning they did not have an elevated creatinine um, and were not living with HIV. And uh, 40 to 50% in both sites have started PrEP. Um, which says when you offer this as part of a comprehensive package of prevention tools, uh, men will use it. Um, I'm not quite ready to, to, uh, to because of the re relatively early data from our new cohort of young black MSM in Atlanta, but I'll say in Atlanta where we have a provider on site um, that our young black MSM in our new cohort study are also having not quite this high uptake, but substantial uptake and we're not providing it for free, but we are providing navigation to help them get either copay assistance or compassionate use. Um, and it's, it, it's in the double digits, uh, and it, it's probably in that zone of 30 to 50% coverage that we need to bend the curve. So all this is great news. Um, I wanna end by talking about a couple ways that we're, th we're, th we're thinking about what it looks like um, to reach 30 to 40% of behaviorally eligible gay men with PrEP. And do we have room in our primary care clinics um, to have these guys coming in and asking, uh, get, answering questions about their sexual risk behaviors every three months to see if they might now be eligible, to a be answering questions if they're on PrEP to see if they might need to come off, and to come back every three months to do HIV testing and, and get asked about their adherence. It would be a tremendous impact on the healthcare system, which I'll quantify in a minute. One of our approaches is, is a, a mobile app-based um, uh, project, which is called HealthMinder. So this is developed, supported by the Mac AIDS Fund, and it really offers um, a lot of health services for gay men. So guys answer questions um, that ballpark how often they should test for HIV, whether they might be PrEP um, candidates, and then they get steered to develop a testing plan to order condoms or test kits but they also can assess themselves for PrEP eligibility themselves with the, with the current CDC questions. If they're possibly eligible, we show them uh, providers in the area and give them driving directions, et cetera. And I wanna just show you some, and then if they're not eligible for PrEP, they will be re-asked in a month, um, hey, can we ask you a few questions again? So they're essentially continually being um, given the opportunity to reassess themselves uh, for PrEP eligibility. Um, we're just wrapping up a study of 121 gay men in Atlanta and Seattle. I'll just highlight for you that the median age is 31 um, and that we have uh, sort of 40 to 50 percent, I'm sorry, we have about 50 percent non-white um, participants in this study uh, who are mostly gay men, although, um, you know, 15 percent of them have never been tested for HIV. Um, this just shows in this mobile app, um, users can go to all the, get information on lots of different stuff. And what I wanna highlight for you is um, that if we look at just those prep items that, that, that these, these participants haven't finished a four month follow up. They, haven't, they have an average of about two months into the study at the time of this data poll. So in the first two months, over a third of them had sought out prep information. Over one in five of them had actually screened themselves for prep eligibility. And, um, and so far, we're not done yet, but 10% of the HIV negative men who were eligible for PrEP have started it, um, two thirds of whom uh, ha found their PrEP provider on the app. And so this is sort of providing a self-service tool and it again, it reinforces the idea that if you lower barriers, 
I think guys will use this. Incidentally, about 60% ordered condoms during the first month and 91% have reported using those condoms they ordered. 38% ordered home HIV test kits. And, um, and two thirds of those were guys who at the beginning when we asked them, are you thinking about getting screened soon, said no. But given the chance to order a kit, um, ordered one. And a third of the users who didn't have a testing schedule, um, by the time they reached the form, so this isn't everybody yet, um, only the first 40, but, uh, but a third of those who didn't have a testing plan ha had one by the end. So we think this app has great potential just to uh, put screening tools in the hands of guys and, um, and let them manage that themselves. Um, but the other issue is these, uh, these visits, like coming in every three months to do STD testing as a part of your prep care and HIV testing. So, um, so CDC uh, envisions people on PrEP coming back at least four times a year. We estimate there might be um, slightly less to maybe as many as 1.7 US MSM who would be behaviorally eligible for PrEP. And so their quarterly screenings just for the guys on PrEP would be another three and a half to six and a half million care visits per year. And so uh, we are thinking about the idea of a home monitoring kit that could reduce economic burden on pa patients and on providers. So what you see here is a mock-up. These kits um, are now produced, and I'm happy. We, we bought extras, so I'm happy to send one up, and Chris can uh, put it outside his office or staff so you can play with it. But it basically send, mails out a kit to their home where they can collect urine, rectal swabs, a throat swab, and blood, from which we can do STI testing, creatinine, um, HIV testing, and then they do a short behavioral survey on an app. Um, what the provider gets is what, what you see on the right, which will have um, a sort of green light, yellow light, red light for HIV testing, symptoms of acute uh, HIV infection, STIs, creatinine levels, self-reported adherence, and so on. So if everything's green, that would suggest to the provider that the labs are, are good, the self-reported behaviors are good, and this is probably somebody who can just be signed off to continue PrEP. If there's a yellow or a red, they probably would call that patient in at that point. This has been vetted with providers um, who like the idea and say that if it helps me do prep well, it, it sort of lays out for them what they need to be thinking about. Helps me do prep well, um, then I think it's fantastic. Provider, another provider says I think we have to decentralize, um, particularly for folks who don't have good experience as providers. Um, patients think it would be nice for HIV testing um, and, uh, and, and once we showed patients this kit, four out of 15 of our sort of first small study said they were more likely to remain on PrEP if they could monitor themselves from home. This is going in the field as we speak, uh, this year in Atlanta, Boston, and um, San Francisco. And so I just want to end um, with, uh, with a, a video, which is our, our PrEP at home video that we showed to participants. They do have to collect a lot of specimens and there are a lot of ways they can screw this up. And so this is actually not even quite the final version, but it gives you a sense of um, sort of how we're communicating some of this uh, information in a way that's hopefully lighthearted or fun. Um, so this is one of our research coordinators, Jasper is the star. Prep at home is an easy way to stay healthy, self-screen and do the right thing, all in the comfort of your own home. Mm -hmm. Here are a few things to look out for while completing your prep at home kit. First of all, be sure to read the full instructions Ooh, and don't mess it up and have to do it all over again. Be sure to remove only one item at a time. Ooh. Hey, stop monkeying around. After urinating in the cup, use the pipette to fill the tube up to the box. For the throat swab, look in the mirror. Looking good. DNA testing is sensitive so a gentle caress on the sides of the throat will do. Time for the <coughs> rectal swab. That wasn't so bad, was it? The blood samples can be a bit tricky, so hey, focus here. Read each step of the instructions carefully. It was a cute kitty. Now brace your finger and prick it with the device. Not as bad as you expected, right? Now you've got to milk that sucker until you see a drop. Bring it right to the tube. Keep it flowing. It's time for the specimen card. Now drop, don't blot, one drop in two of the circles. I said don't blot. <laughs> Just one drop of blood per circle. No, 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 wait. Let it dry for four hours before closing the card. Once dry, you can seal the bag, fill out the date, and pack up everything in the mailer. 
Next, complete the online survey. You've just continued on the path of a healthy life for you and your community. Thank you. So, um, so just to uh, sort of wrap up. I know you want to see it again. Um, so just to wrap up, you know, for us, we're really thinking about the epidemiology and we're thinking about disparities and how that overlays on the rollout of PrEP. But uh, those things aside, the, the common issues here are how we get to scale. And I think we need to be thinking um, very much outside the box and outside models of providers sitting in clinics and men coming in and saying, I heard about this thing. Um, or saw it on a billboard, how are we going to reach people at scale and how are we going to develop tools that make it feasible and acceptable for really a pretty high level of monitoring? And um, how do we do that in ways that reflect the underlying epidemiology and the lack of health insurance among many of those we want to reach? So those are some of our areas of focus. I want to thank you again for the amazing opportunity to be uh, part of this panel with Chris and, uh, and be part of the, the uh, centennial celebration. Thank you. Take maybe one or two questions if anybody has any, and then Patrick and I are both happy to stay around for a few minutes and speak. Um, Here's Patrick. Homie. I could start. Um, I mean, first, I think it's important to say uh, that that uh, health insurers are funding this, and although that's not all the solution, it's an important piece that we should not, um, you know, uh, fail to recognize. And and my friend Jen Cates at Kaiser Family Foundation keeps saying uh, she, if anybody knows of an insurance plan that's denied someone, she wants to know because we're looking for that um, that case. So health insur health insurers are generally supporting this at this point. Um, there are some states that are looking at more innovative ways uh, to use ADAP-like mechanisms to support uh, uh, Truvada prescriptions, and so uh, both New York and Washington State are essentially using public uh, infrastructure to support either the care visits or the medications. And then the other two pieces that are in play are there's a copay reimbursement uh, mechanism through Gilead and a compassionate use. So I think. Um, I think that's a start. The other thing uh, I think to keep our eye on is that the, both the components of Truvada will come off patent in 2017. And so I think as we're thinking now about research and programs, we need to at least have one of those tracks of thinking that says, what if this is at generic pricing? In South Africa, we pay less than $30 a month per person on PrEP. And so if we let, allow ourselves to think about what the situation might be like a year and a half from now, um, then we, we may think about more creative options. Uh, but, for, but I think it's a critical question, especially in the interim. And I would just add internationally that many countries, Truvada is a part of treatment programs and it's, it's available as a generic. So th this is the program for PrEP with all the screening and testing and regular visits and drug provision has been uh, costed out by the Thai Red Cross, which is providing it in Thailand. And it's 900 baht a month, which is about a dollar a day. Um, so that's still out of the range for a lot of people, but it's nowhere near what we're paying uh, at full price, obviously. Um, so, so there, there is some play. Um, and Gilead has, has uh, now lifted their uh, uh, price reduction to five times the federal poverty level. Um, it was at one time the federal, uh, federal poverty level. So at five times, that, that really raises a lot of people into eligibility for, for drug assistance. Not that they need the money. <laughs> well, all right, if there are no more questions, uh, please join me again. Oh.
So I think the the barriers up till now, um, it, it's been it's been a, a, an array of issues, but certainly a primary one has been cost. Um, uh, the UK is a good example. So they they did uh, the Proud study, which was one of the ones with very high efficacy, which essentially um, provided PrEP through the National Health uh, in an implementation exercise and randomized people either to immediate or delayed PrEP if they wanted to take it. Um, and found very high effectiveness and also, unfortunately, very high seroincidence in the men who, who uh, weren't offered immediate PrEP. Uh, and so it seemed like a natural that they would then implement, and it turned out that cost has been the principal barrier. They're also part of the full, full pay. Um, when you compare the lifetime cost, particularly for a country with the national health, uh, uh, I think that's actually uh, not a terribly cost-effective decision. With Thailand, actually, Thailand has approved PrEP uh, for Truvada for PrEP use, uh, but is not paying for it. And they very explicitly have said, and they came back to, to us, uh, that they wanted to see cost-effectiveness data. And that is part of why the project that we're doing includes a cost-effectiveness element. And the, we're using drug donated by Gilead, full disclosure, uh, because the NIH requires that. Uh, but we're doing the cost effectiveness at the price point in Thailand uh, to really get a sense of what, what the actual cost is likely to be. Um, so, and, and I think the cost effectiveness argument uh, really is driven by how this is tailored. Um, for a number of countries, uh, certainly in the African context, their big concern is that uh, there are these enormous numbers of people who remain untreated uh, and that treatment costs are a priority. And the idea of using antivirals when you don't have people fully treated for prevention is very hard, uh, is a hard case to make. Um, and this is why we think the epidemiology is so critical because the more that you really tailor this where incidence is happening and for people who are at very high risk of exposure, obviously the more cost effective it will be uh, and the more likelihood is that you will actually have an impact on reducing treatment burdens uh, going forward. And, and uh, you know, this, this uh, gets to a, an old debate about primary prevention. Uh, but certainly for some populations, particularly for young women and girls in Eastern and Southern Africa, current primary prevention is not working. Um, so I think there's a, a case to be made for really investigating this. Uh, can, can I just say, I think there's also a workforce um, issue uh, domestically, and Ken Mayer talks about the provider paradox where ID docs don't see treating HIV negative uh, patients as their purview. And primary care docs feel like these drugs are complicated and the people who knows how to use them are ID docs. And so they're sort of wearing those shirts that say, like, I'm with, you know, I'm with him, I'm with her, like pointing at each other and saying, um, wondering where this should be implemented. In the back, maybe last question. Yeah, so uh, obviously screening uh, for kidney function is a part of PrEP, and, and not everybody is a candidate based on, on that criteria. Um, so far, and regular monitoring is, is, is a part of, uh, of the program as well. Uh, so far, but these are early days, uh, that screening has, has effectively, uh, you know, pulled out many of the people who would potentially be at risk, so we haven't seen uh, so much. Um, but obviously that, that is a consideration. And, it, and uh, of course, there are some new, less nephrotoxic agents uh, in the pipeline. There are a number of trials with other agents, uh, and of course, some of them not oral, some injectable, longer acting agents. So, so uh, this is an area of very active research, uh, but I think it's also uh, important to say that, you know, we have a very hot epidemic, as you've seen, and we have an effective tool. Uh, so waiting for the next generation uh, of, uh, of PrEP uh, that will be more renal sparing, um, in my view, is, is, uh, is really an individual choice. Uh, but right now, very few people have that choice. Uh, and that's what we need to expand. Okay, thank you.